rise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. Good morning and welcome to worship with us at Crystal Springs Methodist Church. We are so glad to have you with us today. We would like to encourage you to sign our registration cards. If you are a visitor, please feel free to sign that. There is a place for you to share your email information with us if you would like to be included on our email list. If you are worshiping with us online, welcome. We are so glad you have chosen to join us that way. There's also ways that you can let us know online that you have joined us, and we encourage you to do that. We are so glad you are here. Uh, we do have a, quite a few announcements this morning, so I want to jump right into that. Please continue to lift up Brother David in prayer. He is still battling some illness this morning, so we wish him well. And um, what, David, if you're watching, we want you to know that we are thinking of you this morning. Our 200th birthday is coming up on October the 19th and the 20th. We have some incredible activities planned for that weekend. Uh, we have started uh, publishing the schedule. The biggest thing uh, we want to share with you is there will be a catered lunch after church that day on October the 20th. We do need you, though, to RSVP and let us know by October the 11th if you'll be joining us that day so that we can um, let uh, the people that are preparing the food, let them know the numbers for that day. So please just call the church office and let us know by October the 11th. At this time, I'm going to invite Miss Julie Johnson to stand. She has a special announcement, and I think she might be letting us know what's going on with the boxes on the altar. So, Julie. Y'all hear me? All right. Hello, guys. My name is Julie Johnson. I'm the missions coordinator here at Crystal Springs Methodist Church, and I wanted to tell you guys about our newest mission project. Every other year, we participate in something called Operation Christmas Child. That is through Samaritan's Purse Organization, and it is the most wonderful thing. The kids have been so excited. Um, what we will do is I'm going to ask anyone in here who feels led to take a box to fill it up with wonderful toys and things for a child. And Samaritan's Purse Organization will literally ship these boxes all over the world. Now, what's so wonderful about these boxes is, is they'll be filled with the things that you put inside, but with those boxes will come a 12-lesson a discipleship program that each child will be able to participate in that's basically the gospel message. So with those boxes comes the message of the gospel. So we have 50 boxes here that our Blaze group put together on Wednesday night. We had the best time doing that, so I thank them for that. So I suggest going to Dollar Tree and getting items. We can't put anything that's liquid breakable, no food, um, no toothpaste, nothing that would possibly spill in the box, but just fun things, stickers, toys, things like that. And so I've got a video here for y'all to see. If you would, if you feel led to get a box, if you will just after church, come and bring the box to me, and I'll number it, write your name down so I'll know who has a box and the date the due date for boxes is October 27th so you have one month All right now I've got a video for y'all Children open their boxes. You can hear the laughter, the cheer. Each gift brings a joy to their heart. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive, and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Every shoebox gift is delivered with a verbal and written proclamation of the gospel in more than 100 countries every year. This is an evangelism project, and it all starts with a very simple shoebox gift. Volunteers are really the heart of who we are and what we do. When we pack the boxes, it's a reflection, a little glimpse of God's love that we're pouring out. When you pack the box, pray. We never know 
how God is going to use that box. They go by plane, they go by riverboat, they go by motorbikes. These shoe boxes go to children in some of the most isolated areas of the world. Your shoe box goes from you filling it full of toys to all ends of the earth to share the name of Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. After receiving shoebox gifts, children are invited to a 12-lesson discipleship program, The Greatest Journey. The child is discipled, not only know God, but make God known to others. They started to know the power of prayer. They want to know more. From this, we are seeing lives transformed for the kingdom of God. Yo tenía nueve años cuando me dieron mi regalo a, a través de la iglesia. Solo Dios me tocó y sentí en mi corazón algo fuerte. Ya ves, yo sumergí el pecado mío desde hace tiempo y yo no puedo regresar atrás. A mí me encanta compartir lo que es la Biblia con mi hermanito pequeño, Yalil. Y yo le digo a la gente, amistades, que busquen a Dios. When I was 14 years old, I started teaching my first The Greatest Journey lesson. If I shared the gospel to them, I really, really hope that they share the gospel with everyone they know. The heart of Operation Christmas Child is evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. In every church, we are teaching them how to reach out to their neighbors. Operation Christmas Child became the answer from God. Children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it's time for us to go where no one else went, so the gospel can cover this earth just the way the water covered the ocean. Let's pray for the outreach to continue. It has to be our burden to reach them with the gospel. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. Like Julie said, if you want, um, come get a box after church and just let her know. Um, that's one way that we can reach out uh, this, this season as we um, head into Advent and Christmas. Also, if you're like me and you've been watching the news about Hurricane Helene and all the devastation in Florida and what's been going on in eastern Tennessee and uh, western North Carolina and in those areas, Brother David and I were talking and we received an email from our... Um, West Tennessee, Mississippi Conference of the Global Methodist Church. Um, our denomination has pa um, partnered with uh, Faith Responders, which is an organization that goes in um, at, in times like this and um, helps with relief efforts and work. And if you would like to uh, make a contribution towards that today, 100%, 100% of any monies given goes straight into the relief work. None of it goes towards administrative cost. If you would like, you can make a, a check out and just put hurricane relief on it. And we will be sending that off to our uh, mission partners as they begin this most difficult work in these areas that have been so devastatingly um, impacted. And uh, one other note as we prepare to worship, please 
remember the family of Brother Johnny Crosby, who passed away this past Friday. Um, he was the director here at Kent Wesley Pines for many, many years and was one of our interim pastors um, when Brother John had to be away during, one, um, during deployment. So we want to remember that family um, as they go through this time of grief. Let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, as we come before you now with so much heavy on our hearts, Lord, we come knowing that you are the King of glory, that there is not one thing that you're not in control of, that you are not already over. And so, Lord, we come to worship you today, putting our whole trust, our whole faith, in all that you are, our Lord, our Savior, our King. Amen. you please stand and join with me in our call to worship. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful. For they will Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Please remain standing as we join together in our opening hymn, number 89, Love Lifted Me. I was singing deep in sin, but the peaceful shore, buried deep in shame within, singing to rise the war. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, God said, Am I? Love lifted me. Love lifted me. 
as we join together and affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Oh, that was lukewarm. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Come on down, kiddos. Come on down. And if anyone has any little ones that are five and under after this, when I leave, I always go into the nursery, and I'm doing Sunday school for them in there. So just so you know, if they want to come with me, they can. All right. There you go. Okay. No, you, ha you have to acolyte. Okay, so this morning the question is, whose opinion is important? Hey, Wyatt. All right. Oh, Nora, did you have an answer? The disciples' opinion? Interesting. Okay. So the word says, this is what the Romans 14, 4 says, Who are you to judge the servant of someone else? It is his own master who will decide whether he succeeds or fails. And he will succeed because the Lord is able to make him succeed. All right. So we, I got a little help this morning from uh, Maddie Ruth and Violet and Mary Corinne with some pictures. But here's the story. So Mark went to a Christian day school. His teacher gave him an art class assignment. Each student had to draw a picture showing how he or she had done something to serve Jesus. When Mark was doing his homework, he drew this picture. And so the girls drew, here, you stand up and show them. So it's, it's a little boy walking his dog. So that is Mark. And this is, that's the dog, but it's not Mark's dog. The l dog belongs to his neighbor. She was not sick, or she, excuse me, she was sick and could not walk her dog. So Mark took her dog for a walk every afternoon. He liked to help his neighbor. And he remembered that Jesus said to do what? Help, that's right, help other people. Mark liked his picture. When Mark's older brother saw the picture, he laughed. He said the dog looked more like a sheep. That made Matt Mark feel bad, so he showed the picture to his mother. His mother said that if the picture was how to show how he served Jesus, he should have drawn a picture of a church and a cross. Hmm. Mark did not like the, his picture anymore, but he didn't have time to draw another one. The next day, Mark felt bad when he put the picture on his teacher's desk. He thought he would get a bad grade. But when the teacher asked him to explain the picture to the rest of the class, he felt better. The teacher said it was a good picture. She put it on the bulletin board for everyone to see. Mark's brother didn't like the picture. His mother didn't like the picture, but the teacher did. Whose opinion was more important? The teacher's. Mark's mother and brother had not given the assignment. They would not give Mark his grade. It was more important that the teacher liked the picture. 
Sometimes we judge others and make them feel bad. Sometimes others judge us and make us feel bad. We have to remember whose judgment or opinion is important. Listen to what Paul tells us. Who are you to judge the servant? We would say student, right? So who are you to judge the student of someone else? It is his own master or teacher who will decide whether he succeeds or fails. And he will succeed because the Lord is able to make him succeed. In the story we just heard, the teacher gave the assignment, so the teacher gave the grade. Jesus is the one who has told us how to live with him. Therefore, Jesus is the one to judge us. We are not to judge others or worry when others judge us. When we do fail at something, we know Jesus will forgive us because he is the Savior who died to pay for our sins. Remember, when Paul told us that Jesus is our master who will judge us, he also said, and he will succeed because the Lord is able to make him succeed. You can serve God. You can do what is right. You can because who's on your side? Jesus, that's right, God and Jesus are on your side. He is able to forgive you. He is also able to make you succeed. Be glad that Jesus is the one who judges you because he loves you and he helps you. Remember, he loves and helps others too, so you don't need to judge them, right? Mm -hmm. Mary Corinne's going to help us with the prayer. Father God, today we pray that we would love each other without judgment and that our unity and love would not cause uh, will cause others to come to faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Savior as my own. 
Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your promises. Sometimes, and that's all we've got. When life gets to where we just don't understand, when the storms come, when the floodwaters rage, when the ravages of sin just seem to overwhelm us, your promises prevail. And we know that we can trust you, and we can stand and live on those promises because they are all fulfilled in your Son, Jesus Christ. Because of his life, because of his love, we know that your promises hold firm and hold true. And Lord, it is because of your promises and your faithfulness that we know that we can come to you today with all the things that are weighing on us, all the things that are scaring us, all the things that um, are before us, and that we can just lay them at the cross, knowing that you're already at work, that you're already in those situations, that you're already making a way. So Lord, our prayer is that we will find and seek out your plans that we will follow the path that you are laying out, that we will be a part of what you're already doing. And God, that by following you, others will see that your promises are good, that your promises are trustworthy. And that, Lord, in all things, others will see your son in us. And Lord, as your body, as your people, we come together and we pray the prayer that your son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's now sing hymn 93, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
Let us pray. Lord, let us never forget that everything we have is from you. So now we gratefully and joyfully give back. Amen. remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Today's text comes from the fifth chapter of Matthew, verses 38 through 48. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, You will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Really? Thanks be to God for those ten verses? Nope. Nuh-uh. Mm-mm. Not doing it. Nope. Mm-mm. Not one, not one of those, not one of them gives me a warm fuzzy. Did it you? It did, no. Uh -uh. I mean, like, if I'm being honest, not one of those verses gave me a a warm fuzzy. I mean, seriously, when you read that, you got to be like, is he serious? He can't be serious, right? I mean, like, that's got to be a bazinga moment, right? Like, a little bit of levity in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, a little bit of like, ha ha, just joking, trying to lighten the mood, because that's... That's too much. 
I mean, like, maybe that's how it worked 2,000 years ago, Jesus, but not today, not in 2024, right? I mean, that, that's just not going to cut it. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be great if it worked like that? I mean, you know, right? Wouldn't it be awesome if we could just kind of pick and choose what we wanted to follow, what we wanted to obey? You know, that whole Jeremiah 29, um, 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you that are going to prosper you and not harm you. That's great. Love that. I'll memorize it. I'll wear it on a t-shirt. Got it. I'll keep that one. The whole John 3, 16, for God loves you. You know, I'm going to send my son for you. Got it. Keep it. Love it. That's great. But those 10 verses, mm, no, thank you. That, I mean, mm -mm, I'll pass. But it doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like that, does it? That's not how it works. And the reason it doesn't work like that is because God is more interested in our character than our comfort. God is more interested in our holiness than in our happiness. And that begins and ends with you and I becoming more and more like Jesus, like his son, every single day. God has revealed himself to us in and through his son, Jesus Christ, period. And right here, the very mark of whether or not we're becoming more and more like Jesus is right here in these 10 verses. Can we not only forgive our enemies, but can we love them? This is tough stuff. Because I don't know about you, but there are some of the people that have hurt me. They hurt me big. I don't want to forgive them. Okay, well, maybe I can forgive them, but I certainly don't want to love them. Not the way I love the people that love me. And actually, I'm going to take that back. I really don't even want to forgive them. I mean, Jesus, you can forgive them because that's what you do. But I don't want to because they've really hurt me. Or maybe... Is someone that hurt your kids or it hurt somebody that you love. Y'all, this isn't easy. But if we're going to be more and more like Jesus, and let's face it, that's who we're made to be, then we've got to take seriously all his words. So let's do this. Let's dig into these 10 verses. So he starts out in verse 32. I'm going to go back and reread 32 through 42. And this time I'm reading it from the message. He says, here's another old saying that deserves a second look. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues the shirt off your back, then go gift wrap your best coat and give it to them. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, Use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more of this tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Yeah, it's not doesn't really get any better the second time around. The Sermon on the Mount has been full of all these surprising statements from the beginning up until now. But honestly, out of all the statements Jesus has made, these are some of the most controversial, and if we're honest probably to his original hearers and even to us today, these are probably some of the most infuriating words that he speaks. I mean, think about what he's saying. He's saying, don't resist an evildoer. If someone hits you in the face, let them hit you again. If someone sues you, give them more than they're asking for. I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy. Don't turn anyone away. Don't just forgive your enemies love them. Pray for those who are trying to hurt you. I mean, y'all, it sounds crazy. It's ludicrous. I mean, how are we even supposed to make sense of this? I get it. Jesus is commanding us to go against every fiber of our beings, and it sounds completely foolish. Now, let me be clear. I want to be very clear. What he is not saying is to stay, this is not a justification to stay in an abusive relationship. It's not a justification to abuse Anybody, period. That's, that's, no, that is not what he is saying, okay? Um, I want to be very clear on that. Um, 
I've seen this uh, meme or a statement on social media that says, you know, don't swim across an ocean for people who wouldn't cross a puddle for you. Maybe you've seen that meaning, you know, in other words, don't do for, don't keep putting yourself out there for people who aren't giving it back for you. And I'm, I say to that, I say, yes, <laughs> I, I like that statement because that protects me. That protects my heart. I don't like being vulnerable. I really hate feeling like I've been taken advantage of and I really don't like being feeling like a fool. And yet Jesus is saying, no, swim that ocean. Go the extra mile. In fact, don't even go the extra mile. Go a marathon for those people. Because how else are they going to know the sacrificial love of Christ if those of us who claim the name of Christ aren't out there living it for them to see? And I get it. It's foolishness. But what does 1 Corinthians 1.25 say? It says, the, this foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Yeah, it's going to look kind of crazy to the world. But God's ways are not our ways. And when you read these verses, do you know, notice how in these 10 chapters, or these 10 verses in the Sermon on the Mount, there's something dr dramatically different about these commands than any of the others in the Sermon on the Mount or those that have come before. Because so far up to now, like Jesus has warned his audience about lust, about anger, about divorce, about taking an oath and um, you know, following through on your vows. And all of those things are within our control. Like I can control my anger. I, can con I choose how to react to a situation. I choose whether or not I'm going to respond in anger. I choose whether or not I'm going to respond to um, um, whether or not I'm going to keep an oath or if I'm going to uh, pursue something that I am lusting after. I mean, that's all within my control. But in this situation, these commands are different because we're asked to give up control and place ourselves at the mercy of those who, at best, despise us and, at worst, hate us. We're asked to respond not with, you know, getting back or, or self-preservation or protection, but we're asked to respond with grace and mercy. And what do grace and mercy even mean? Well, the, the very basic definition of grace is giving to, some, to someone that which they haven't earned, that which they haven't deserved. Mercy is making sure someone doesn't get that which they have deserved or that which they haven't or that which they have earned. So in other words, when someone has hurt me and what they've earned from me is my anger, what I should give them is love instead. And I'm just like probably every person in this room, my reaction is nope, nope, not going to do it. Mm -mm. I want to hold on to that anger. I want to hold on to that grudge. And honestly, I don't like what it reveals about myself when I read these 10 verses. Because these 10 verses, they frustrate me. So I try to explain them away. I try to look at them and go, oh, well, that, you know, that Jesus didn't really, that's not supposed to apply to us in 2024. He really didn't mean that to be like a universal thing to, you know, to, to go on, you know, 2,000 years later. I want to look for some alternate way of, you know, something that will help me explain this standard of living away because I realize that I'm not doing this. Because, you see, these ten verses are kind of a barometer of my own spiritual walk with Christ. They're a barometer because it kind of holds that mirror up to say, am I loving and living like Christ? Am I able to forgive and love my enemies. You see, and to those of us who are walking with Christ, to those of us who know the Lord, we realize that this is a call for us to just grab on to Jesus even harder and try to become even more like him. And to those of us that are outside Christ, that are trying to live in our own righteousness, what we're going to do is we're going to automatically reject it and go, nope, mm -mm, that's weak, it's unrealistic, and it's just plain stupid. So you see... Those of us in Christ, those of us that know the Lord, will realize real quickly, as much as it makes us uncomfortable, as much as it want, we want to squirm in it, 
we realize that what he is describing here is exactly what he did for us. Let that sink in. What he is calling us to do is exactly what he has already done for us on the cross. So the first thing we got to ask ourselves when we're confronted with these 10 verses is how does our heart respond to these commands of Jesus's? Does it make us want to draw closer to him or do we automatically try to reject him? Then he goes on in verse 43 through verse 47. He says, you're familiar with the old law. It says, love your friend and its written companion and hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with prayer. For then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves. Because this is what God does. He gives his best. He gives the sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any, any sinner can do that. Yep, these words aren't getting any easier. I mean, seriously, like verse 46. He gives his best to everyone, the good and the bad. I don't know about you, but I was raised to think that, hey, if you do good things, good things are going to happen. You do bad things, bad things happen. I'm kind of like, hey, God, I'm doing good stuff over here. Shouldn't I be getting better things than other people? And yet Jesus says, no. God, it rains on the just and the unjust. We're supposed to give our best. How did he put it? How does um, this translation put it? Um, let your enemies bring out the best in you, not the worst. Whew. I don't know about that, but it seems to be getting kind of ridiculous to me. Kind of outrageous. And Jesus says, yeah, th that's it exactly. Outrageous love. These, these verses kind of make us have to ask the question, whose standard of love and justice are we going to live our lives by? Because you see, the world encourages us to repay bad with worse and to only love those who love us, right? I mean, like the golden rule, right? Do unto others what they've done to you. Oh, that's not the golden rule? Do unto others before they do to you. Oh, that's not it either. No. No. You see, because Jesus' standard is outrageously higher, God calls us to return bad with good. Actually, he calls us to return bad with great and to love unconditionally, regardless of the other person's actions toward us. Because here's the thing. It's not about what they've done for us, to us, or haven't done. It's about what Jesus has done for us and is doing in us, period. So all of our relationships should come from that the truth of what Christ has already done for us and is doing in us. Remember this, you will never, ever, as long as you're alive, look into the eyes of another person that Jesus did not die for. Whether or not they ever accept that, you will never look into the eyes of someone that Jesus didn't die for. And therefore, he is calling us to show them that kind of sacrificial love that he has already shown us period. Jesus is teaching us in these verses that true faith and its faith, our faith in him should shape all of our relationships and how we relate to the people around us. It's not about what they do for us. It's about what Jesus has already done for us. And living this way, living according to Christ's way, yeah, it's going to keep us out of step with the world, 100%. Because it is out of the ordinary, I'm so sad to say this, but it is out of the ordinary to tell the truth, to go the extra mile, and to love your enemies. That is not the way of this world. Let's face it, the mantra of our times is look out for number one, get them before they get you, show no mercy, and it is all about me. 
And I mean, nowhere is this more evident than in lunchrooms and locker rooms. Am I right? Remember those? Can you go back to your high school days? I mean, think about it. And I had a fairly decent high school experience. I mean, you still couldn't pay me enough money to go back to high school. But I mean, like, the lunch table was like a petri dish of gossip, betrayal, and broken relationships. And anybody in education or anybody with teenagers will tell you this. I mean, I see it all the time from week to week in small groups. We'll have one week we got this group of three is best friends and this group of three is best friends. But these two groups of three, they're not talking to, the, to each other. Not at all. And then all of a sudden, the next week you come back and these three are no longer friends with each other. These three are no longer friends with, with each other. And two of them from over here might be friends with one from over here. And they've ganged up and now you got three more groups over here. And they're all fighting and you can't keep up with it. And sometimes the problem is literally somebody looked at somebody else wrong or someone's hair looked better that day. And I know I sound petty, um, but sometimes, y'all, it's really no more than that. And sometimes it's a lot bigger than that. But yet I've seen lifelong friendships blow up over something just as small as what happened at the lunch table or what happens in a locker room where it's all about the competition, it's all about being number one, it's all about making sure that, that your name is on top, getting ahead, being the best, cutting others down. Um, I'll never forget uh, one time when I asked the, uh, some of our guys, I was like, you know, what's it like in the field house of the locker rooms? And they're like, you don't want to know. We're like, we're not going to tell you. We can't tell you what we talk about. When you're at Marines, one of our seventh graders, I had to pick him up after school. And I said, and they were like, hey, I'll be in the locker room. And this particular um, young guy didn't have a watch. And he's like, just come get me. I'll be in the field house. I was like, okay. And some of my senior high guys were standing right there. And they were all like, no, you can't go in there. They were like, well, tell us what time you're getting to campus. You know, we will bring him out to you. And I was like, why? What's wrong? And they're like, oh, no, that is no place for you. Meaning that what was said, what went on, whatever, I shouldn't hear it. In other words, you know, they were compartmentalizing what was going on. And y'all, this was, I mean, and this, then you introduce a lot, excuse me, then you introduce social media into the mix, and then it really gets fun. Um, because you've got, we see it all the time. You have social media bios or pages that will have like, you know, a scripture verse or a cross on it, you know, about God is my number one, you know, Jesus first. But then yet the feeds and everything else is full of some of the most ungodly stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with the walk with Christ. Or you go to someone's private stories or their fence does. Moms, dad, if you don't know about that, come talk to me afterwards. That really is where people really tear each other down. Really go after each other. You see, we think it's okay to compartmentalize. And it's like, oh, well, I can be godly at church, but I can do all this other stuff elsewhere because I got to get back at somebody. I got to get them before they get me. Unless you think that we left all that in high school, I could have just as easily titled this break rooms and boardrooms, dining rooms, family rooms. Because it doesn't matter where we are, it doesn't matter how old we are. We are always called to live Jesus's outrageous standard of love we are always called to forgive to love our enemies to put others first it applies it all applies to all of us all the time even in 2024 uh, Russell Moore a contemporary theologian pastor he's the current editor of Christianity Today in a recent interview, he was telling this story about how um, he has heard this familiar tale recently um, from pastor after pastor when they teach on these passages out of the Sermon of the Mount. Invariably, after reading these passages, after preaching on these passages, um, you know, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, forgive others, they will have people from their congregations come up to them and say something to the effect where did you get those liberal talking points? And when the pastor would say, I'm literally quoting Jesus. 
direct quote. The response would be something to the effect of, well, maybe, but that doesn't work anymore because that's weak. Church, when we get to the point where the words of Jesus become subversive, then we got a problem. Because you see, Jesus is clearly portraying God's standard for all of us. And I get it. We, we hear these words and we realize that we haven't met this standard. And we realize that to live this way is going to look foolish to the world. When you start truly living the words of Jesus, especially in these 10 verses, you're going to look foolish to, those, to the world and, this, and to unbelievers. So you've got to ask yourself, are you more worried about how the world sees you or about how Jesus sees you? So just when I start to think, okay, well, through these nine verses, I think I can do this. Jesus has made a way. Then we get to the last verse, verse 48, and it's kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, now you've really gone too far. He says, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Now this one really cannot apply because there was only one perfect person that ever lived. His name was Jesus, not Jana. So, whoo, I'm off the hook. Right on. Yeah, remember, doesn't work that way. If he said it, it must be doable because he's not going to set us up to fail. And remember, you got to look at the whole of the Sermon on the Mount and what he's doing here. This verse 48 is kind of a bookend to what he started all the way back up in verse 21. And so if you go back to verse 20, what he said when he kind of started this section in verse 20, he goes, I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So he got this verse in verse 20 saying, your righteousness has to be better than that. And then he gives us all these commands about how we're supposed to live. And then all the way down in verse 48, he says, and you got to be perfect. And I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I'm going, okay, got some problems with this because we all know that all have sinned. We all have sinned. We fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. There are none righteous, not one, Romans 3.10. So what are we to do? Are we all just kind of, you know, in trouble? Well, this is one of those times where it helps to understand their first century understanding of this word perfect. That Greek word teleos means, it doesn't mean perfect as we understand perfect. It doesn't mean without flaw, without blemish. That word teleos means finished. It means brought to completion. It means lacking nothing to fulfill its purpose. Kind of like that chair is perfect. It's not without blemish. It has some scratches. It might have some stains on it. But that chair is ready to fulfill its purpose. Its purpose is to hold you up when you sit in it. So even though it might have a stain, a scratch, so it might be marred a little bit, it can fulfill its purpose. So when Jesus, when we're called to be perfect in Christ, we're called to be ready to fulfill our purpose, which is to be like Christ, to live for Christ in the world. And we're called to live out Christ's righteousness. In other words, it's about being that whole Christian. It's about not compartmentalizing. It's about not thinking that it's okay to be one way at church or one way with one group of people and one way somewhere else. It's about being the love and the embodiment of Christ wherever we are. Whether it's a lunchroom, a locker room, a break room, a boardroom, the family room, no matter where we are. Living that complete life in Christ and it's only possible because of Jesus because of what he did on the cross you see because of Jesus's righteousness that was credited to us when we believed in him in other words don't forget that Jesus didn't just die the sinner's death in our place but he also lived a righteous life for us and it is only through the finished work of Christ on the cross that we can do any of this. 
think about this. Jesus is, I mean, like he is the living embodiment of the Sermon on the Mount. He never resisted an evildoer. He turned the other cheek. He gave to his accusers. He served his persecutors. He loved his enemies. He prayed for his attackers. And he did all of this in obedience to the Father. And so, yes, even though we're still going to battle the flesh and we will still fall short over time, hopefully we will be more and more conformed to the image of Christ and less and less conformed to the ways of the world. So whether we are in lunch rooms or locker rooms, board rooms, break rooms, dining rooms or family rooms, if we're serious about being followers of Christ, serious about living for Christ, then our lives must reflect his and must be marked by his radical forgiveness, his extravagant generosity, and his lavish love. Let us pray. Lord, as tough as your words sometimes are, thank you, God, for challenging us. Thank you for living that life and making the way for us to live it also. Lord, may our lives be marked by your kind of radical forgiveness, extravagant generosity, and lavish love that others may see you in us. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn 343, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. benediction this morning is going to be a challenge. Um, on Tuesday mornings in our youth Bible study, um, they've kind of thrown me a couple of shocks this year. The first one was that they wanted to meet every Tuesday, which was very exciting. The second one was that they wanted me to give them a challenge every week, something for them to do, um, to challenge them in their faith, something that they could do for other people. So I want to challenge you today. Um, so here's your challenge. I want you to, in response to God's word this morning, as he has laid the name, because I'm sure he has, of someone that has either hurt you or hurt someone that you love, someone in your life that you can um, either generously give to them or lavishly love in some way, do that this week. Find a way to give generously and to love lavishly on somebody that has hurt you in the name of of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
and strengthen. 